session. <laughs> it's nice to meet everybody. I'm so glad to be with you today. Hi. Somebody looks like they're joining from somewhere tropical, unless that's a really creative background. <laughs> really nice background. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, all right. So I know we're a few minutes early, Trish. Um, I oh, do. That, that's good. Okay. So do you, is the chat going to be open throughout the whole session? Because I have, I have two little things that I'm, I'm going to do uh, a little challenge, if that's okay. Awesome. I'm going to give away two copies of my book. So oh, let's, let's leave the chat open if that's a possibility. Oh, of course. Yes, it's totally open. And um, you have controls to share your screen. And okay. I'm recording this as well. Excellent. So what, I, what class is this? What are you guys learning? What is? This is marketing for artists. Oh, it is? Fantastic. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, let me jump right in. So hello, everybody. My name is Rachel Wilkins. I am an art business coach. I'm originally from the UK, hence this accent. Um, I've been in the States for about 13 years now. Uh, primarily, I came here as an artist. I wanted to come and, you know, develop a career and sell my work. I came to New York City because it is really the art capital of the world. And I have an interesting story that has led me uh, to build a business named Conception Arts, which has been helping artists around the world for the past decade. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump right behind these slides. And if anyone has any questions at any point, um, just keep a note of them. And I figure we can do a little Q&A at the end, just so we can keep the flow going. Uh, but obviously, if there's anything pressing or you need me to slow down on anything, feel free to just give me a holler and let me know. All right. Can everybody see my slides okay? Yep, we can see them. Perfect. All right. So let me move this out of the way. All right. So as I said, I'm Rachel Wilkins. I'm an art business coach. I'm based in northern New Jersey, just right up the street from the university. I am in Sea Caucus. Uh, I am originally from the UK, as I mentioned. Uh, just to give you a little background on my experience, in 2016, I was named the New York Business Journal Women of Influence, that is for my work with the emerging artist community, and more recently was named 40 Under 40 LGBTQ Leaders by Business Equality Magazine. I'm also the host of the Smart Art Business Podcast, which is about 45 episodes in, and we have had some amazing conversations with thought leaders, artists, people from institutions, gallery directors, etc. cetera. Uh, and you can listen to that anywhere where you listen to podcasts, Spotify, Apple, uh, play, uh, Apple Podcasts, etc. cetera. Uh, also host a weekly Coffee with Artists show, which is every Friday on YouTube. If you want to check that out, you can go to Conception Arts YouTube channel. We've chatted with over 50 artists so far. And right now I'm a dedicated mentor for the New Museum's New Ink program, which is an incubator program uh, that was an in-person incubator program prior to COVID, uh, but is now a digital uh, incubator, which is a fantastic program uh, in New York City. And I am the founder of Conception Arts, which is an organization that produces pop-up events before COVID again. <laughs> and now we are working closely with artists to help them uh, build sustainable businesses and understand how to market and develop a personal brand. All right, so just a quick, few quick facts. I have been in business for about 10 years and I have had the pleasure of working with over 5,000 artists on two continents in 14 different cities. And most importantly, and I only bring up money to just show what is possible. I have built a six figure business selling my artwork without a gallery, without an agent and without an institution helping me. So I wanna give a little context and just kind of share my story uh, with you now. Just move this out of the way. I think we're good. Okay. So what I really wanna share with you is that there are alternative paths to success in the art world, other than those that are really defined as kind of the societal expectations of what an artist can accomplish. And I am absolutely 100% living proof of that. So when I was 26, I emigrated to the UK, to the US, even from the UK. I left a corporate job. I was working in recruitment in a job that I hated. And I came to Manhattan with kind of my paints in my backpack and about $500 in my pocket. Uh, I came here and I got a job 
working in a bar and I would create all day in my tiny studio in Manhattan. And then I would go to work at night and work as a, as a bartender to make money, to be able to buy more supplies to make more artwork. And after a couple of months, I had a collection of work that I was really, really happy with. And I decided that that was it. I was going to hit the streets and I was going to start to find a gallery to represent me. So on my way to work every day, I would take my portfolio and I would go to a variety of different galleries. And, you know, I set myself a target that I would hit basically five galleries a day. And I figured that within a couple of months, I'd be flying high. I would get my big break. I would have all this success. You know, I was 26 and I thought that this is it. This is going to be my big moment. What unfortunately happened, uh, as some of you may have experienced already, or hopefully you haven't experienced this, and I can give you some guidance. Um, unfortunately, the art world was uh, a very closed space. It was very opaque in terms of who was given the opportunities and who was not given the opportunity. Voila. And so I was basically greeted with rejection. Can you mute? Yeah, can you hear me? We got it. Okay. Sorry. So, so yeah, I was greeted with rejection after rejection. And finally, after a couple of months of kind of just keeping going and, you know, having grit and perseverance, I actually got one gallery to agree to give me five minutes. Uh, the representative there seemed to enjoy my work. And she said that she would put me into a group show that was coming up. So I was thrilled. I'm like, this is it. This is my big break. I'm going to have the opportunity to showcase my work. This is so exciting. And so as the date grew closer, I got really excited. I went out and bought myself a new outfit for the opening. I invited all my friends, all my connections that I've made. And then when the big night came, my excitement unfortunately turned into disappointment because this big gallery show that I'd you know, put on a pedestal for so long and thought that this was the only way that I could have success was really just a flop. I didn't sell any work. I didn't make any connections. And I just felt utterly disappointed with the whole experience. Now, while I was grateful to be surrounded by supporters and friends that had come out to, you know, to support me as an artist, I just felt so frustrated and deflated because I'd spent a year of my life chasing this dream. And then when I finally got it, it was a total anticlimax. It was totally disappointing. So the next day, I basically halted my plans. I decided the art world was not for me. And I thought, what is the point? I'm not going to be able to make it. I've done everything. I've hit like over 100 galleries. I had this moment and it was just a total disappointment. So that night at the bar when I was bartending, so I started to think to myself, why do I actually need a gallery? You know, I had that experience. I had that moment that I, you know, was striving for. And when I actually had it, it was totally disappointing. So is there a way that I can carve out success as an artist on my own without the need for a gallery institution, agent, or representative? And so I basically set out to understand and learn everything that I could about the art world. I answered open call invitations. I researched, I was on Craigslist, I was on art forums. I started to go to art shows and get to know other artists and understand who the curators were and who the decision makers were. And the next 12 months, I decided to do everything in my power to prove to myself more than anybody else that I could be successful without a gallery. Now, slowly but surely, the opportunities started to present themselves. My friends, first and foremost, started to buy my artwork. And then their friends reached out and they would buy a piece. And you know, first I thought, this is just my friends being nice. They're just supporting me. But what started to happen was word of mouth. I started to make more and more connections. I then got a solo show at a men's health club, not a gallery, which actually turned out to be one of my most lucrative shows, which is something you wouldn't even fathom that a health club would be somewhere where you would sell, you know, kind of five figures worth of artwork. But when you think about it, an alternative space like that has a captive audience. You have these, you know, people who are coming to this space who have the means because they're investing in this, you know, this very expensive uh, health club. They have the means, they have the finances to be able to invest in artwork. And that's what they did. So I ended up having this huge opportunity to have a show there. 
I then got a commission that allowed me to go to the beach to create artwork, which was an artist's dream come true. And then I was asked to design an album cover and USA Network reached out and I had a piece featured on a TV show called uh, Royal Pains, which aired on USA Network. So all of these exciting, amazing things were happening and I was still working at the bar and I was still trying to do 20 things at once. And I was actually experiencing legitimate success without a gallery. I was quote unquote living the dream <laughs> at that time. Then something happened, which really threw me for a loop. I was at a show and this gentleman came along, collector, and he really loved my work. He fell in love with the pieces. He was very smartly dressed. He, there was nothing suspicious about this man. And he, he asked if he could give me a deposit for the chair, for the, uh, for the three pieces that he wanted to take. And by chip, that was a check, it wasn't cash and said that he would come through to the following day with the balance uh, if he could take the three pieces with him that night because he had transportation. Now, very naively, I said, yes, sure, take my artwork. I have your check and I have your business card. And the next day when I went to throw, uh, to, to cash in the check, uh, you probably guessed it, but the check bounced. And basically I had no artwork, no money. And the guy's phone number was basically just ringing out. So over $5,000 worth of artwork at that time as a relatively new artist here in New York City was just stolen and I was completely devastated, totally just heartbroken. Uh, I was ready again to throw in the towel. And I realized at that point that, you know, if I wanted to have any kind of success or longevity in this business, in the art world with all of its nuances, opaqueness and, you know, challenges, then I needed to get really, really serious about this business. And so I got to work and again, I learned all I could about art marketing. I learned about protecting my work, protecting myself. And I tested different marketing channels to see what truly worked. And I began to hone my business skill, the bit, my business skills. And so the next year, nobody stole my artwork. First and foremost, I had a solid understanding of who my collector base were and how to reach them. And I sold six figures worth of my own artwork. Now, I am not sharing this with you to say, look how amazing I did and how great I am and et cetera. The reason that I am sharing this part of my story is that I believe that this is the possibility for every single artist. I think every one of us is uniquely creative and that there is a unique audience for each of us. We just have to be able to tap into that audience and to nurture relationships with them. So from here, I actually took a little bit of a a turning point, instead of continuing to focus on my own career, I founded a company with my business partner, Jennifer. I founded Conception Arts. Uh, at the time it was Conception Arts Show. We are more inclusive than just art shows. Now we do a lot more. So hence Conception Arts. Um, for the last decade, I have basically helped creative entrepreneurs to grow their business through events and also through hands-on coaching and mentorships. Now, I've worked with everything from kind of fashion designers to musicians, all, all different types of creatives, but my primary focus and really my passion lies in helping visual artists because their journey to success is, is my journey. It's what I experience and it's what I have learned the most about. So over the last decade, we have been throwing pop-up events in unconventional spaces, not your usual galleries. Uh, and we've done this in since 2011 in 14 cities on two continents. We've done over 100 art events at places like Art Basel, uh, New York Freeze Week, Armory Week, and then just pop-up shows in all of these cities around the UK, around the US, and in Europe. And collectively over the past five, past 10 years even, we have worked with 5,000 artists. Now we've worked with painters, sculptors, photographers, illustrators, digital artists, designers, mixed media artists, and ceramicists as well. There's probably a ton more mediums in there as well. Too many to mention, but you name it, we have worked with them. And it has been an amazing, amazing experience. So what I would like to share with you today is 
the really what I deem to be the core principles that in my experience at least are essential for art world success. And they are signature style, branding, storytelling, social media, and selling. Now the first one, social uh, signature style, let's just jump right into that. Now this is right here where I'm gonna give a little, I don't wanna say a test, <laughs> because that's Trisha's job, um, but a little challenge um, to whoever can name all six of these artists first in the chat. I'm gonna give away a copy of my book. If you can name all six of these artists right here. Some of them are super easy, I know, but maybe there's a couple in there that are a little bit of a challenge. Um, so whoever does that, Trish, I'll let you keep an eye on the chat as to who <laughs> as to who can do it the quickest. Um, and again, this is not a test. This is just just a little bit of fun. But the reason that I bring up these five or oh, six artists is they all have a strong signature style. It's an instantly recognizable visual language. So. I think most of us have heard the, the expression jack of all trades, right? Master of none. Jack of all trades, master of none basically refers to somebody who has a broad range of skills, but doesn't necessarily get experience and mastery of one particular area. Now, as artists, yes, I am guilty of this myself. I like to dip my toe in a little bit of everything. I like to experiment with new things. I get distracted by all the different technologies, et cetera. That is fine behind closed doors. But what I learned pretty early on in my career was when it comes to establishing yourself in the art world, it is really, really important to master a particular style, subject, or approach to your work. And that is really because buyers want consistency. You know, when our collectors invest in us, they're not just investing in that one particular piece of work. And what it shows them when we have a signature style is it shows that we have an expertise and mastery of our personal style. We're demonstrating an understanding of our medium that goes beyond the surface of creating, you know, just creating for creating sake. And it shows that we have our own unique visual language that we can use to converse with the viewer. Now, did anybody get it? <laughs> Bernard got uh, three. Nice. Which three? Warhol, Keith Haring, and Retina. Or awesome. Okay. <laughs> Should I, did anyone get more than three, or anyone match the no, three? No, that was it. <laughs> so we've got um, Barbara Kruger in the middle at the top with uh, Love for Sale, and then the Obama portrait is Kahindi Wiley, and then bottom right is Chuck Close. So a little bit of a little bit of everything here. So um, Bernard, we'll, we'll we'll award that one to you since you got three <laughs> out of six. It was a tall a tall order to ask everybody for six. I know. <laughs> All right. So if if you haven't heard of him, Malcolm Gladwell is a phenomenal author. He wrote a book called Outliers, and in that book, he talked about basically the, the core principles to become an expert at anything, not just at art, at creating artwork, is that we spend 10,000 hours doing that thing, right? The rule which he basically considers success, the key to success in any field is simply a matter of practicing a specific task, which in this case would be your creative process for 20 hours a week for 10 years. Now that seems crazy to you guys because I know you're, you're all relatively young on this call. So the idea of doing something again and again for 20 hours a week for 10 years might seem a little intimidating. But Gladwell estimated that the Beatles uh, put in 10,000 10, hours of practice while they were playing in Hamburg in the early 60s. And that Bill Gates, the founder of Microsoft, also put in 10,000 hours of programming before he went on to found Microsoft. Now, he did this in his, famously did this in his mom's garage. He was squirreling away building code for about a decade before he built this just massive, massive company. Now, I am not suggesting that anybody on this call cannot experience art world success 
if you don't have 10,000 hours. We all know that that is not true. There's always going to be outliers to these rules and to these suggestions. The reason that I share this information with you is because I think it's really important that we get crystal clear about where and on what we should be focusing our attention on. Because when we identify our strengths and areas of expertise early, we have the ability to then excavate those ideas and work towards a level of expertise while also building our business at the same time. Again, I dabbled with everything. I have done photography, I've done sculpture, painting, watercolor, you name it, I've done a little bit of everything. And I don't consider that wasted time. But once I did find my groove, once I did settle into a personal style, only at that point did my work begin to look cohesive. So if you are someone that creates multiple genres of artwork, it's totally fine. I just would suggest that perhaps you begin to at least focus your attention on the areas that offer the most opportunity for growth, both creatively and also financially when we're looking at things from a business uh, aspect. Okay, so let's move on to branding. All right, another opportunity here, folks, to get this copy of my book, right? We got five artists here. Each of the artists that we see has an instantly recognizable and identifiable personal brand. So this is not the artwork. This is the artist themselves. So five artists here. Whoever can name the most of these artists again. Oh, let's go back. Hang on one second. Uh, I will give a copy of the book too. So I'll leave that with you for a couple of minutes. So what is personal branding? Well, Personal branding is essentially a, an extension of your traditional resume. Uh, branding expert Cynthia Johnson, who I had the pleasure of working with a couple of years ago, she compared personal branding to credit. Now, if you have uh, the opportunity to buy a house or a car or any big major investment, when you do that, you go and the company or the business or whoever it is generally runs a credit check. Now, most of us know just from moving around the world, we kind of know what our credit score is. And we also know that when the person runs our credit, we know what they're going to find. Unlike credit, our personal brand, basically everything that exists about us in the digital space, we don't know when somebody's going to look us up, right? We don't know when somebody's going to run a search on us. And we have no idea what they're going to discover. And that can be a problem, especially in today's age where everything, everything that we do is documented, is, visu is visual, is online and discoverable for people. In fact, I just had a conversation with a gallerist who has a gallery in Zimbabwe and has taught all over the world. She's given lectures at Art Basel. And I asked her, I said, what is the first thing that you do when you get a portfolio from an artist? Where do you go? Do you go to their website? Do you do a Google search? And the first thing she said to me was, I go to Instagram. So that is a big reveal, right? That is new information. That is a new way that collectors, that buyers, that gallerists, that decision makers are looking us up online. And it's something that we should really be considering. So, you know, we have no idea when these searches are going to, to basically to happen. So it's our, it's our job to make sure that we control the narrative, that we know what information is out there about ourselves. So if you haven't done so already, I do suggest that at some point, doesn't have to be now, doesn't have to be today, but you do a search on yourself, a Google search, see what comes up and ask yourself if what you discover online, is that the story that you want to be telling prospective clients perspective decision makers and those that are the gatekeepers for opportunity and if it is not this is something that can be fixed especially you know you guys are all young people this is a prime opportunity to you know start and take control of that narrative now so having a, a recognizable and personal brand can really separate you from the competition so you know, it, good personal branding can really be the difference between a one-off sale and a lifelong collector. 
Personal branding done well basically solidifies trust and it cements client loyalty. And every point of contact that you have with a potential customer has the potential to influence their decision making. And when you deliver consistent messaging, good, strong visuals, and the same color palettes across your email marketing, across your social media, the clients will begin to trust you. And data shows, you know, throughout kind of commerce history that people are much more likely to invest and hand over their hard earned cash to people that they feel they know, like, and trust. So let's just jump back. Did anybody get all five? No, <laughs> what do we, what do we got? It looks like Abigail and Bernard were tied. So uh, since Bernard won the last one, Abigail. Abigail, okay. So what do we, <laughs> who did we get? I'm intrigued to see who we got. Warhol, uh, Frida and Dali. Awesome. And the other two were a little difficult. So the, the one, the guy in the snazzy suit is Romero Brito. He is a famous uh, Miami-based artist. And then the uh, artist on the far right is Chantelle Martin. She's an amazing contemporary artist uh, from the UK living in uh, the United States. All right, so the reason I share these five artists is because aside from their artwork, there's something notable and memorable about the way they present themselves in the digital in the physical space. When we're moving around, especially the digital space, we want to be able to stand out from the pack. What people perceive is generally what they believe, right? And this is based on what they hear, they see, and they think. Perception is a reality, especially in the digital space. So I want you to just imagine that you you have the opportunity to meet with a curator of a top museum or institution. It's a super exciting opportunity, but you then learn that there's 20 other artists that got the same opportunity. How are you going to stand out from that pack? You have your signature style, you have your, you know, your well presented, your brand, uh, your visual branding is on is on point. Your work is titled, it's named, etc. You've done your homework, you have a great bio, everything that you're presenting is great. But what about you? If you had two minutes with that curator, what is something that they would remember about you? And when we think of these famous artists that we see here, what is it that comes to mind? Of course, you know, we look at Dali and he has this crazy eccentric mustache and Frida with her beautiful colors. You know, Warhol with his crazy hair and his oversized spectacles, you know, you kind of get where we're going with this. Now, I'm not suggesting that anybody here or anybody watching this recording run out and have a permanent image overhaul. Absolutely not. But there are some steps that you can take to cultivate an image that affirms and supports your role as the artist. And it can be something as simple as a certain color clothing that you wear to shows you know, a certain item that you accessorize when you take your photographs to support your social media posts. For centuries, artists have been known as, you know, eccentric and exciting. And there remains a certain allure from the buyers and the collectors and those that move around these spaces to have that experience. So it doesn't take much to create it. It's just something that you have to be comfortable with. I don't want anybody to step outside of their comfort zones with this, but find something that resonates with you. And just remember that those first impressions truly, truly matter. People don't just buy artwork. They buy a piece of you. They buy a piece of the artist. Okay, so moving on. Next section that I wanna talk about is storytelling. Now, we're, we live in a world right now where we are just bombarded with ads, with online offerings, everything from cybersecurity to soaps and products. You know, we have stories, stories and products. It's usually the stories that influence the decision making when people make a purchase. I think Apple is a really good example of this. So when Apple rolled out the iPhone 5 in 2010, we were not presented with a commercial where, you know, we learned about the LCD screen or the PCB connector or the digital casing that the phone exists in. Instead, during that one minute ad spot, Apple 
put out a commercial that could warm even the coldest of hearts. It showed everyday people experiencing real life events via the FaceTime feature. That was a new feature on the iPhone 5. It showed a toddler wishing his aging grandpa a happy birthday. It showed a woman FaceTiming with her mother overseas and showing her pregnant belly. It showed a young woman interacting and engaging with her lover who lived on, an, on another continent. What we witnessed was technology bridging the gap between a part, a partness, between loneliness and between adversity. Consumers did not purchase the iPhone 5 because of its hardware or its processing speed. Consumers purchased it because Apple did a really good job of making the people in that commercial relatable. Apple did a really good job of connecting with our humanity, with our human being. So marketing guru Seth Godin once said that by telling stories, we have the ability to engage the emotions of our prospective clients. Rather than aiming for their wallets when we wanna sell something to them, we aim for their hearts and their minds. We take them on an emotional journey, a journey that is so compelling that it has the power to move hearts, minds, and ultimately wallets and credit cards in your favor. So what story does, what role does story play in the sale of artwork? So ask yourself, why do people buy original artwork? What is it that is the difference or the motivating factor for a person to invest a significant amount of money in something original, as opposed to snagging something or buying something online via Target or Marshalls, something that is factory produced? Why would somebody pay a premium price when they can get a more economical price at the local mall? The majority of the time, the answer is story. Something about the piece spoke to them or the artist's personal story was relatable to them. The buyer was fe felt inspired by the journey that the artist had taken to bring this beautiful work of art to life. So what does that mean for us as artists? Well, simply means that if you can learn to tell good stories, the world really, really is your oyster. And if you're somebody who feels that storytelling is difficult, I, I want you to really just reconsider because storytelling is naturally in our DNA, right? We as human beings have been telling stories around a campfire for just eons since you know cavemen times it's something that we naturally thrive in so anybody can learn to tell a good story having a few solid stories in your back pocket and sharing them often with the people that you trust the people around you whether that is a loved one your dog or your cat to trish to whoever you know you is in your world can really really just move the needle so I just challenge you to take some time to consider the stories that are in your own life experience. And if you need a little bit of inspiration, here are a few good topics for storytelling. So talk about your process. If your artistic process has given you any particular challenges or struggles, this could be an exciting opportunity to bring the viewer in deeper into the experience of your artwork. Or maybe you use a particular type of medium that the general layperson has no understanding of. You know, for example, an artist that, that I worked with a few years ago, she created encaustic works. And the process of encaustic goes back centuries. So, you know, by talking about that process, you bring that viewer in and you educate them and they feel a connection. What about your motivation? Is there a specific topic or subject that motivates you to create? Maybe it's a social justice issue or a political issue, or maybe it's children or family or your spouse or a loved one. Maybe there's a historical figure or a particular artist that's inspired your journey. Just get clear on what that motivation is and learn to tell that story. And then finally, personal. Nothing connects with another human being than something that is a relatable human experience. 
only do this if you're comfortable, right? This is another thing, another area where, you know, it, it has to be within your comfort zone. But maybe you've had a particular challenge. Maybe there's something that has been, you know, a moment that has been a, a hero's journey. There's something that you've really struggled to get through that you could share with your audience and make relatable to your artwork that could inspire another person. So let's talk about social media, which is really the fourth pillar that I believe you need to have art world success. So I like to teach social media from really a more holistic standpoint. I don't like to get too much into the technical details. And the reason for that is the likelihood that within a few years, a few months, or maybe even a few weeks with the speed that things are changing, you know, the algorithms are changing, social media platforms could be you introducing new software new you know new features uh, or perhaps facebook could even be shut down next week who knows so what i like to teach is more of the overall holistic um, purpose of social media so in basic terms in social media nothing is permanent the tech giants are constantly moving the goalposts so if you're not crystal clear about the why of social media a lot of your future efforts may be in vain. Basically, everything that you do on social media, I believe, should be done with the intention of bringing people off the social media platforms. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, why would I do that? Why would I invest all this time, you know, nurturing and getting to know my audience on social media if I'm going to pull them away from the platform? There's two, you know, kind of schools of thought here. Yes, social media is a great place to build community, but I want you to just imagine this scenario. So it's a year from now, you've spent an entire year building up your community on social media, gaining tons of followers, putting in a ton of effort, and you've grown a list of 5,000 followers on your art page on say Instagram. You're selling, you're interacting, you're having connections and conversations in the DMs. The next day you wake up, you log into the into Instagram to check your messages and you suddenly realize that you no longer have access to your DMs or you can no longer see who is following you. You panic as you realize you've spent all this time building your business on Instagram. You have this sinking feeling and you realize that you have no contact information for all of those people that you've been building connections with on the platform. Now, you may reach out to the help desk and complain and, you know, be like, what the heck is happening? But the chances are at that point, it will likely be too late. Now, the hard truth is this really could be a reality. Instagram, Facebook, and a lot of the other platforms have the ability to change their services and the offerings that they currently provide to us for free as they see fit. They have no requirement to alert us, the users, of any upcoming changes, any service restrictions that we've become accustomed to. In fact, as we see these platforms look for more ways to monetize their offerings, this is something, the access to data is something that will most likely be one of the first things that we see disappear. So how can we get ahead of this? Well, the best thing to do is to use social media as a tool, right? To use it as a way to bring people off platform and into our world. So what is the best way to do that? One of the best ways to bring people off platform is just to simply get their email address. Now, yes, our email lists could disappear too. That's a possibility. But I always, always encourage you to back up any data lists or anything that you have with people's contact information. Make sure you back that up. Once you have their email address, there's no way you can lose that email address, of course, if it's backed up. So, you know, whether you use a lead magnet, which is just a tool to get people to give you their email address, or you just start to have conversations with those that you're already DMing, just make sure that you try to get that email address. Your future self will thank you. The next thing I want to talk about in terms of social media is reading the digital room. So 
imagine if you will, you're at a fancy cocktail party. It's at a big swanky hotel and it's going to be attended by all of the influential collectors, all of the big money people that invest in art, all of those decision makers from museums and galleries. How would you move about that room? Would you walk up to a, pe a group of people that are standing having a conversation and just yell, hey, buy my art, right? Probably not. Or would you maybe start to show some of these people some photographs of your buddies at a Mets game? Or maybe share your political viewpoints? Probably not. I'm secretly hoping, <laughs> probably not. Now, many people do exactly that online. The digital space should not be treated any differently to that room that you just imagined, especially now knowing what we know about what those decision makers are doing when they're looking at you online. They're going to Instagram, they're going to Facebook before they even look at your portfolio or your website. That is how they are auditing you. So I'm not saying that anybody here should not have fierce opinions or be advocates for change or any of that at all. On the contrary, artists have been just the guiding force behind so many movements for social and economic change. What I am suggesting is that we look to build a robust, you know, sustainable, professional and courteous business when we're putting ourselves forward online. What I do suggest that you do, in addition to sharing your art artwork, is to regularly introduce yourself and to do it often. Don't assume that everybody who follows you online knows what you do or knows how they can work with you. Assume that everybody knows nothing. Introduce yourself, let people know how they can work with you, tell them how and why you create what you create, and you'll begin to build that sense of community. Now, we all know that social media can be an exhausting place. I think that, you know, it's one of those things that we have to be really conscious of with mental health, with fatigue. And as of right now, a lot of the social media providers, a lot of these platforms are aiming to keep us on platforms, on the platform, engaged for as long as possible. And the reason that they do that is so that they can sell more advertisement to their sponsors, right? So that they can get more paid ads. Now, because of this, social media really has become a big time suck. So one of the best suggestions that I can make if you are starting to build community on social media is to really get ahead and start to plan out your content in advance. So carve out some time once a month to put out 30 days of content. There's a whole host of scheduling apps that you can use to do this that are free, such as Later. Um, I believe Facebook has its own built-in scheduling service now as well. So use those resources and get ahead of the game and schedule out your, your social media so that you can take a step back and actually enjoy all of the wonderful parts of being an artist, which is, of course, the creative part. So what are we going to post about on social media? Well. When preparing for, for social media content, ask yourself if what you are about to share is community building and is the time that you're about to spend creating it, do, is it, is it going to deliver results, right? That is the primary goal. We want to use this tool that we have at our fingertips to build community. And if it's not, you may want to consider spending your time elsewhere. Now, I'm not suggesting that everything you post on social media has to have an immediate financial or success metric. That's not the case, but I do think it's important to be mindful about how much time we're spending on the platform and ensure that what we are doing on there is going to deliver some form of result. So here are some things that you can be doing on social that will push you in that right direction. So is what you're sharing educational? Are, are your audience learning something new about you and your artwork? Great, that's perfect content. Is it inspiring? Is it something that delights or moves your audience? Does it engage? Does it invite a response or maybe motivate? Does, it share, does your share warrant an action, a response, an engagement? Or does it just entertain? 
Perhaps that's just as simple as you sharing your process or sharing a little video from your studio, something that keeps your clients, your customers, your community engaged. Finally, don't be intimidated by the platform's individual analytics. Analytics can be a super powerful tool. Pay attention to which posts work, which posts see the most engagement, the most views, and essentially just do more of that because that is where you're going to see an increase in your audience. All right, so the final topic I wanna to share with you is of course selling, because this is where everything that we just talked about comes together and we hopefully can you know, earn some revenue, build uh, some structure and begin to scale our art business. So there are a few things that I feel you need in your back pocket in order to successfully sell your work. The first of which is something called an elevator pitch, which you may have heard thrown around before, but I want to get very specific about what an elevator pitch is for an artist. So an elevator pitch is essentially an impact statement, which is a sentence or two that you can reel off verbatim in about 30 seconds or less. So basically the term comes from the, t if you can, t you're in an elevator with a big decision maker and you have literally the time between two floors to tell them who you do, uh, who you are and what you do, that is your elevator pitch. Now, if we don't have an elevator pitch, what often happens is when somebody says, what do you do? We don't have a great response. We say something like, I'm an artist, right? And that's it. But if we get good at kind of practicing this and honing it and just having something verbatim that we can reel off with ease, this can really open up a lot of opportunities for us. Now, a good strategy if you're struggling with this is to just use a template like this. For example, you could say something like, I help art lovers achieve serenity in their home by, or home or workplace by uh, creating and curating my acrylic paintings. Now, again, that is just an example off the top of my head. You've got to make this your own, but it's something that will convey what it is that you do and how somebody can work with you. So write this out, get comfortable with it, practice it again on loved ones like you do with story and take the opportunity to use this when you're networking or socializing with any potential prospects. Again, the doors that this can open for you can be just amazing and it can really bring some opportunities to you. So the final kind of piece of this puzzle in terms of uh, selling or the second to final, the penultimate piece is a call to action. Whatever you do, whether it's on social media, whether it's a text message to a prospect or an in-person meeting, an, uh, an action without a call, a post without a call to action is potentially an opportunity wasted. If we don't present people with a clear and easy way to reach us, hire us or purchase from us, we're really shooting ourselves in the foot. We're sabotaging potentially our own success. So we, we don't wanna make our clients have to go looking for how to work with us. So the easiest way to avoid that is to just let people know in a social media post, something like to learn more about my work, click on my website link. It can be found in my bio or originals available for purchase, drop me a DM for details or grab a copy of my, you know, one of these prints by sending me an email, the link is in my bio. Super, super simple, but something that should be integrated into everything that you post on social media. So the final piece of selling is, of course, asking for the sale. This is one of the one of the biggest struggles that I've seen in my community when I'm teaching and coaching is that folks are so reluctant to actually ask for the sale. There are two super effective questions that you can ask if you have a potential client or collector standing in front of your work or interacting with you about your work on social media. The first one is, are you in the market for an original piece of artwork right now? And the second one is, can you picture this piece in your home or workplace? Now, Important disclaimer here, don't use this question on every single person that put eyes on your work, right? That's going to probably scare a few people away. This is a question that you ask if somebody is interested and engaged and asking leading questions. It's a question that asks for a yes or no answer, right? It cuts to the chase. 
Now you'll get either one of one of two responses. It'll be no because now is not the good, you know, the right time, or no, it's out of my my financial reach, or it's going to be a yes. At which point you take their credit card information or you make that sale happen. So if it's a no, it's not always a hard no. If it is something like perhaps it's out of their financial reach, that is an opportunity to present an alternative to them, a, a secondary piece, something that is perhaps a little less expensive. I've seen so many sales come in that second wave because rather than just letting that client walk away, that client clearly wanted a piece of my artwork. So I'm gonna work hard to try to make that happen. So that really is everything from me, folks. I hope that this has been uh, valuable to you. I hope that this is helpful. Um, I am able to take some questions if anybody has any. I think we have about 10 minutes or so. So let me uh, stop my share. All right. Okay. That's amazing. <laughs> I hope I didn't cover too much because I, I tried to squeeze in as much as possible. <laughs> no, I think it was wonderful. And I think the selling and asking for money, that was a nice way to, to wrap it up. Um, hey, guys, you, come on, don't be shy. Well, I was, <laughs> um, oh, sorry. Oh, I wanted to ask something. Sure. So, um, for, during your presentation, you were uh, talking about how um, you, like someone took your artworks basically robbed you yep. and I wanted to ask like with your experience now like how would it how would what was a better way for you to handle that situation yeah so now I would never ever hand over my artwork until I had full payment mm -hmm. the only time I would ever ever just take a deposit at this point knowing what I know would be with a trusted collector. And if there was a genuine reason as to why they needed to just give me the deposit, it would there would have to be an element of trust there. And I would have had a contract. I would have had some legal recourse, something that you know they had signed to say that they were gonna deliver uh, you know, the, re the rest of the, the balance. At that point, you know, it was very naive of me to kind of just hand this over to a total stranger. So I think just always being conscious that, you know, no matter how trustworthy somewhere somebody might seem and you know keen on investing in in us we always have to protect ourselves as as creatives yeah thank yeah. you absolutely hi uh when branding yourself and um trying to show the best light of yourself where do you where do you feel is like the best place to draw a line between like a story and like a genuine representation you mean, do you mean like, um, like the vulnerability aspect of it? Like how much to tell? Yeah. Yeah. I think that has to be like a personal choice. Um, you know, there's, there's things that I think come with time and also with age. Like I, I'll give you guys an example. Like for a long time, I, I'm somebody who's been sober. I've been, I'm a recovering alcoholic and I've been in sobriety for eight years. And for a long time, I never talked about that because I wasn't comfortable in my heart talking about that, but it is a big factor in a lot of the work that I produce. So as time went on, I recognized what, what actually happened was I, I shared about it at a show. I had a particular piece and I shared about my experience and how this particular piece had really helped me come to terms with addiction and you know mental health issues. And the person who was looking at it was like, wow, my, my son is in active addiction and he's really struggling and this is really inspiring. And the second that I felt that relatability, I, I realized that it's okay to be vulnerable because my story could potentially inspire somebody else. But again, that came with time and it came from that particular moment. So I think, I think it's a hard balance because I know social media can be a really brutal place for people. Especially, there's a lot of mean people on the internet and I don't want anybody to put themselves out there with something that's personal and vulnerable unless you are confident and, and feel safe doing so. Thank you. Okay, I have another question. Oh. So um, my professor, she's always 
talking about storytelling as well. And in you talking about it, clearly it's a big key to, you know, to make sure um, I get more attention as an artist. But I don't know. I just feel like my story is so boring. Like, I don't know how, how like, I don't know how to say I have a story because I know I do. But I feel like my story is so boring. So Why, like, why do you think it's boring? I don't know. Like, I, I just... I feel like it's bo- like there's nothing interesting like I don't have like I don't have what's what's the word like I haven't really been through like obstacle courses where like I, I struggle and I like you know went through something like I don't have any of that you know I'm just someone who's about to graduate who made a lot of friends who's happy who's you know just trying to be successful and you know um meet more people I really have, like, a relaxed life, I guess. I don't really have, like, interesting stuff to say. <laughs> you, well, first of all, don't don't believe that because that is a limiting belief that you don't have interesting stuff to say. You absolutely have interesting stuff to say. And I want to be really clear that you, art doesn't need trauma to sell, right? It doesn't have to be a bad experience. Like, art brings people joy, right? The fact everything you just shared with me was joyful you know tell that joyful experience that you are young and joyful and excited and you you know you're eager to learn and get to know different people from different cultures that's relatable people will be inspired by that so don't discount your story it absolutely has value yeah I was always struggling I was just like I don't know what to say like I'm just a regular girl just trying to meet other people and experience other art techniques and things like that because that's really like my passion like just always discovering new forms of art like what are what's people thinking about like other people's art and just meeting other artists because there's just so many people like I've like the events that you shared about like um your your business and stuff I've never heard of it but clearly it's something big you know so like it, it had never reached my ears, you know, so I want to be able to um, like get involved in groups like that, get involved with more artists, because clearly there are groups there, big groups that I don't know about. So that's that really is what excites me. Well, let me ask you one question really quick, because sometimes it doesn't have to be anything, you know, lofty and academic. Like what how do you feel when you create your artwork? I feel very satisfied like I and I feel important as well because you know you like it's like um like a mission like you know you you see your process like you like I'll be in like bed or in the shower that's where the creative (laughs) flow starts coming (laughs) and I'll just be like oh I'll think about something and then I'll like write it down and then I'll start like planning it out and I'm like maybe these colors will work and seeing that process come to a reality, like, it's like mission accomplished, you know, it's like that, those little joys that I enjoy, because it's something that I thought about, and I made happen, you know, and not a lot of people have that ability, like, people can have, like, the greatest, greatest ideas, but then they'll be like, I'm too shy to, you know, execute it and stuff, and I just feel like there's power in being able to execute it fully and say, look, I did it, you know, do you see what you just did there? You just told us a story. And oh, it was okay. and it was beautiful. <laughs> and it was inspiring. Oh my God, you're so good. <laughs> and I related really heavily to that last part. Right. And that's the word. That's the magic word. Relate. That's yeah. all we all we need to do is just relate to people. We need to we need to hit them right in the heart. Yeah. And you did that without overthinking it. Thank God this is on record. (laughs) You can play the tape back. Yeah. Yeah. I think sometimes we overcomplicate it. You know, it's just, it doesn't, or we compare, you know, we look at other people and oh, they've got a really good story. And like, just be you, like find your truth and, you know, don't be afraid to share it. Get comfortable doing it. Thank you so much. You're so welcome. Does anyone else want to say anything? Hi. Um, 
At the beginning, you mentioned creating your art and how you spent a lot of time doing so. I wanted to know if it was a possibility to see some of that. Do you have any? Yeah, actually go to Instagram and go to Rachel Wilkins art. Let me put it in the chat. That's actually my art page. Um, I don't get to do as much. I did a couple of commissions recently um, and I did a series last year for uh, Pride Month. Uh, but yeah, you can see pretty much a good, a good example of my work there. That's, that's my Instagram handle. Awesome, thank you. Absolutely. I, I've actually only followed you on um, the business page. Business page. Now I'm like, oh boy, I get to look at your artwork. I'm so excited. <laughs> God, your profile picture is so funny. I love it. <laughs> I don't even remember which one I have. That's fine. Like... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> <sighs> Oh, I'm, off. I'm already off mute, sorry. <laughs> when starting um, your businesses and starting like a small business, like what, do you, what is the most challenging part about like generating revenue, mm. you know, so you can like get projects done? That's a really good question. Um, and I, I did want to touch on, on the business thing because one of the, one of the things that I want to just express to you as, as young minds is that just because you don't see it out there already doesn't mean that you can't create it, right? The reason that I started Conception was because I realized there was no experience, there was no opportunity or there was limited opportunity for people like me who didn't go to art school. I didn't go to art school. I didn't have all these crazy connections. And what I found with the galleries was like, they wouldn't even look at me. Like they wouldn't even consider me because I didn't have proven track record of success, you know, the right resume, all of those things. So I was, you know, I was like, well, let me create something that cr allows a space for people like me. And, you know, let's see how we can build a business doing that. Now, I'll be honest, for probably two and a half years, it was a passion project. We didn't make any money, right? It was, you know, long days, long nights, a lot of kind of sweat equity, as they call it, just working really hard because we were really passionate about it. And I think that's what's really important. If you are gonna start any kind of business, you have to be obsessed with it because you're gonna live and breathe it 24 um, seven. What did ultimately happen was, you know, it got to a point where it was like, okay, well, we need to find a structure that allows us to continue to do this because if we don't, it's a hobby, right? If it's if there's no revenue, it's a hobby. And so, you know, we did it alone. We didn't, there are, of course, you know, different pathways to building businesses. Getting investors was one option and going it alone is another. So we really just, we didn't want to bring in other, other opinions, other voices in terms of investors because I wanted it to stay very authentic. And we just built very small. We started just in New York. We just did events in New York. We found a way to monetize, um, you know, the opportunity. And then eventually once we realized that it worked here, we were able to take it to other places. So I think just grit and determination and, you know, really sitting and considering, okay, what are my outgoings to do this? And, and what, what, is, what are the possibilities and how do I put a structure in place that, you know, allows for a stream of revenue and also not being afraid of money. Like we're so afraid of asking for money as human beings, like it's, it always blows my mind and I, I'm guilty of it too. I remember when one of the ways that we would generate revenue for our events was we, we charged for tickets. So for people to come into the show, they had to pay a fee. And so for a long time, the ticket price was $15. And I was sitting on a plane and it had been $15 for five years, right? Five years, we'd never changed the price. And I sat next to a guy on the, on the plane and I was telling him about the business. And he said, why have you not raised your prices in five years? And I said, well, I don't want to charge people more than $15. He said, why? What do you think will happen? And so I'm like, he's right. He said, go and charge $20. He said, I promise you nothing will happen. And so we did. And that's a big increase, 25% increase to your revenue, to your bottom line. We did it and nothing changed. 
nobody left nobody's decided they didn't want to work with us it just was what it was so take the fear out of the the money part don't be afraid to value your work at what it's worth well, i tell you your marketing is so incredible and and to get someone to to make that step and the commitment to do the shows especially during covid when times are tough you get great turnouts and you, i mean you won me over <laughs> immediately um but i i think what what you're doing is just incredible Thank you, Trish. And I think what, what it comes down to is if you believe in your idea and you believe in what you're offering, it sells itself. Like I, I know full heartedly because I've been an artist and I am an artist that I have to truly get behind what we're offering. And if I don't, if I don't think it's a value, I can't sell it. And that's a really important piece. Does anyone else have any questions? No? <laughs> well, that was exactly one hour. That was amazing. Well, so look at that. <laughs> you gave us so much information. I, I was just like, it was just a pleasure listening to you and hearing your story and all your wonderful advice. Um, so we have two students that have the book. So oh, yep. I'm not or how you you'll just connect with me later yeah but do you want me to send them to you is that easiest or do you want me to send them whatever whatever works best we can chat yeah we'll chat after yeah okay okay well thank you everybody for having me it's been such a pleasure and i wish everybody the best of luck and you have my instagram i'm here as a resource if anybody ever needs anything so don't be afraid to reach out thank you thank you, thank you so much thank, thank you Trish, you're amazing. Oh, thank you. You're amazing. <laughs> thank you for having me. I, I'm so happy. Thank you so much. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye, Bye Rachel. Bye. Wow. <laughs> it was awesome. It's my favorite. Yeah. I felt like that was a really nice, like, last speaker, you know, because you and and I love how she just validated everything everyone's been mentioning in these you know talks that we've had and even if you look back to my first lecture <laughs> when I showed Keith Haring Andy Warhol <laughs> you know I like had the same artist <laughs> that she quizzed you on you guys should have known that <laughs> I knew Keith Haring and um, Andy Warhol but I just didn't type fast enough. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. Well, let's take a break. Let's take like a, a ten, a five-minute break and be back here. Okay, guys. I'm gonna put the recording on pause.